Good evening and welcome. We're, we're glad that you're here and glad that you have chosen to come be with us tonight. If you're visiting, we are certainly glad that you're here and ask that you uh, stay around for a few moments after the services that we may greet you a little bit more completely. Um, also, if you're visiting, you'll, you'll see on the seat back in front of you a visitor's card, and if you'll take a moment to fill that out and pass it to the center aisles, the ushers will be by in just a few moments. We ask you to come to our next time of service, which will be a midweek Bible study, and that'll be at 7 o'clock. And just as a reminder to everyone, the auditorium classes will meet uh, back in the fellowship hall, and then when you get out of your individual classes, be sure to go into the, to the fellowship hall for the, for the end actions of Wednesday night. And hopefully everything will be uh, good to go for Sunday morning. A little bit of an update um, for the Kilpatrick family. As we mentioned earlier, our sympathies extended to them. He had a heart attack yesterday and passed away last night. He was the, the father of Stan. Um, we have a little bit more information. Visitation will be tomorrow evening from 6 to 8 at Spry, 6 to 8 at Spry, and then the funeral will be uh, Tuesday at 2 o'clock, and that'll be at the Lincoln Church of Christ on Meridian Street. So Spry tomorrow evening, then 2 o'clock, Tuesday, Lincoln Church of Christ on Meridian for the actual funeral. Also, continue to remember those that are on the, uh, the prayer list. Don't forget to get a prayer list, which is right outside uh, the door to uh, use as a reminder and a contact sheet uh, during the upcoming week. Preteens, don't forget you have uh, an activity uh, tonight right after services. Scrapbook, don't forget um, you have a meeting on March the 19th 10 a.m. will be a work day. If you have any questions, you can see Sharon Priest on that. If you get a chance um, after services and, and during the upcoming week and, and next little while, check out the, the bulletin board, which is right outside. Uh, Lisa uh, always does a, a great job on that. And in particular, um, the subject matter is the gospel chariot um, missions that, that we uh, that may as well help support. You can get, uh, in, in South Africa, you can get a good update on uh, how that's going, and it's a, it's a very well done bulletin board, and uh, you can get a lot of uh, good information on the efforts that uh, Maysville is sponsoring there. Also, don't forget the upcoming wedding shower for Myron and uh, Molly. That'll be March the 27th, and uh, they're registered at Target and Bed Bath and beyond. Ushers, if you'll pick up any cards, please. Our first song is going to be song number 820, song 820. Our opening prayer will be by Brother Seth Bowen, and our closing prayer will be by Brother Brian Norris. Brother Seth. Come. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for another day of life. We're grateful for this opportunity tonight to come and uh, worship you. And we pray, Father, that as we enter this hour of worship, that we will put the things of the world um, in the back of our minds and, and focus totally on serving you tonight. We pray as we sing these songs and listen to another message from your word, Father, that, that we just won't merely listen, but that we'll listen and we'll apply it and we'll take it with us this week. Father, we're, we're thankful for the blessings that you give us in being called your children. And we're thankful for this group here that meets at Maysville. Father, we pray that you would just help us throughout this community and through our efforts throughout the world to proclaim your word. That those souls that are hungry for the gospel will find it. And those around the world can be added to your kingdom. Father, we're thankful for the physical blessings you give us. We're thankful for our health. We're thankful for the wealth that you give us. You think we're, I think, I'm thankful for um, just the things above our knees that you give us, Father. And we're so grateful for, to you for that. Father, there are some on our, our hearts and our minds that, that are not, not doing well um, with their health, and we pray that you will be with them and comfort them. Father, there are also those that have lost loved ones, and we pray, Father, that you will be with the Kilpatrick family at this time and, and help them to know that, that you're there for them and that we're there for them 
And Father, help us and help us to do anything we can to to let them know that we love them and and uh, we are there for them as well. Father, we're so grateful for your Son. We know that through him, all things are possible, and without him, we could do nothing and would be nothing. But we're thankful for his willingness to come to this earth, to live the life that he did, the example that he was, and to ultimately go to the cross for our sins, Father. And we pray, Father, that we just may try to um, not have that sacrifice be in vain, that we will represent you, that we will show the world what it means to be a Christian and show that example that Jesus was for us. Father, we're so grateful that you're our God and that you allow us to be called your children. And we're thankful for this, this opportunity to worship you tonight. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Eight hundred twenty. We'll sing the first and the last stanzas, please. <clears throat> My precious Savior suffered pain and agony. He bore it all that I might live. He broke the bonds of sin and set the captive free. Oh, that I might in His presence live. He bore it all that I might see His shining face. Freely bore it all, I with him might live. I stood condemned to die, but Jesus took my place. Oh, that I might in his presence live. Up Calvary's hill in shame, the blessed Savior trod. He bore it all, that I might... <laughs> Between two thieves they crucified the Son of God. Oh, that I might in his presence live. He bore it all that I might see his shining face. Freely bore it all. I with him might live. I stood condemned to die, but Jesus took my place. Oh, that I might in his presence live. Very good. 785, 785. <coughs> Again, the first and the last. There's a wonderful place we call home to the city of glory divine. It is built in the garden of rest, and that beautiful home shall be mine. Oh, then wonderful lead and so blessed, where Jesus the master... <coughs> To prepare us this glorious home, there he bids us a welcome to come. Oh, wonderful city of God, just across in that beautiful climb, where the angels sweet echo of song, and musical cadence his chime. Oh, wonderful city of God, by faith in the distance I see. There's a mansion prepared over there. Yes, a place in that city for me. When the jewels of Jesus are brought, there to shine in that land of sweet song. What a beautiful, beautiful thought that I shall be there in that throng. Sweetest peace to my soul it will be to behold such a glorious sight where the sun and the moon neither shine, but the glory of God is the light. Oh, wonderful city of God, just across in that beautiful climb where the angels in musical cadence is chime. Oh, wonderful city of God, by faith in the distance I see. There's a mansion prepared over there. Yes, a place in that city for me. Y'all tuned up and ready to go tonight. Let's see if I can get 
151, 151. This is a song we've sung a few times, Flea as a Bird. I know our uh, guest speaker, his name not coming to mind here, but that uh, did our song work out from uh, uh, Florence. He, uh, he mentioned a couple of songs that were <clears throat> kind of had those flats and a little different sounding, so uh, this is one of those. But it has a good meaning concerning our protection we need for God and uh, we're as, as a bird that need, need some shelter. <clears throat> Flee as a bird to your mountain, thou who art weary of sin, go to the cliff-flowing fountain, where you may wash and be clean. Seventy-seven. <clears throat> Sing all three of these here. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons that fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of... <laughs> The battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a stand in the power of the blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. We sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. 
side when your enemy presses and hand do not fear the battle belongs to the Lord take courage my friend your redemption is near the battle belongs to the Lord and we sing glory honor power and strength to the Lord we sing glory Power and strength to the Lord. 881. 881. <coughs> there is a bomb in Gilead to make the Three hundred ninety would be our song of imitation, if you'll mark that, please. Three hundred ninety. <clears throat> and now number four hundred thirty. Number four hundred thirty. <clears throat> if you'd like to, please stand on this, and we'll sing the first, second, and the last stanzas. <clears throat> My name is in the book of life, oh bless the name of Jesus. I rise above all doubt and strife and read my title clear. I know, I know my name is there. I know. And bore a painful record, but by his blood the Savior crossed 
and placed it on his roll. I know, I know, my name is there. I know, I know, my name is written there. While others climb through worldly strife to call the name of honor, I up in heaven's book is written there. I know, I know, my name is there. I know, I know, my name is written there. Be seated, please. Let me add my word of welcome to you tonight. Glad that you chose to come out and to be with us. A couple of things are imminent in our future. Thought I'd remind you of that. The, uh, of course, the preteen activity tonight after services. If you have students who are in the preteen program, not yet teenagers, all the way from the little bitty guys up to about the fifth or sixth grade, we're trying to revitalize that program and do a couple of activities a month for the, I don't know, the last 10 years we've only done one activity a month with those folks and we've made some adjustments and we're trying to do two and so please uh, get involved in that. We don't have that big of a crowd in that age group but uh, we are trying to keep what few folks we have there busy. Uh, in, in conjunction with that there's a youth rally at Meridianville Church of Christ uh, Saturday the 26th. I'm taking some of the teenagers with me and if you've got a third fourth or fifth grade age young person they're invited to go with us. They'll learn some of the, the songs that are there. Uh, pretty fundamental youth rally talking about relationship with God and some of the text are out of uh, Romans talking about baptism and, and it's, a, it's a pretty basic uh, teaching youth rally. Clark Sims is going to be one of the speakers and uh, this is their fourth or fifth annual youth rally at Meridianville and so if you've got a, a, a preteen we'd love for them to hop on the van and go with us. Uh, you're welcome to go with them but we'll take good care of them if you don't and I hope that, that uh, they go with us. Um, summer is on the way, and with summer comes two events at Maysville, our summer series, which is the Wednesday night, but we also have a summer Bible study series, and that's gonna be on Thursday nights this week. Probably after we get back from camp, we'll do the last two Thursdays in June and all the Thursdays in July. It's a real informal thing at our house. Uh, we'll eat some snacks and some goodies and then sit down for just kind of a question and answer period. And then when that's finished, sometimes it's 30 minutes that we study, sometimes it's an hour and a half. When that's over, folks play games and uh, throw frisbees and various other stuff. Um, our large dog of 15 years has gone to his reward. So our backyard is open now for, for lots of play. You used to couldn't play out in the yard with Mulder. He was grouchy. So there'll be, uh, we rigged some lights out there. So it'll be some outdoor stuff as well as some indoor stuff. And we hope you take advantage and, and come to our summer series. Mentioning camp. Camp is the second full week in June. I think for 19 years we've done the first full week in June. Well, they moved us off of our slot at Freed because of a project that Brad Montague is doing. And uh, it's a thing called Go Camp. And there's several smaller events through a series. And then the first full week in June, that's gonna culminate at Freed's campus. And it's called Go Camp. If you're a senior high student and you wanna go to that, that's open for you. But as soon as that's over, our camp will begin. Uh, and that's the one we'll be going to. We're gonna visit the campus of Faulkner University. President Hillier and Joey Wigington and some guys have made that available to us. Uh, they've got a real nice new uh, multiplex that we can use for some of our recreation. They've made their new chapel available for our uh, worship services that we want to use. And so the second full week in June, and that's open to anybody third grade and up without a parent. And if you're, third, if you're below the third grade and you want to go and mom or dad or somebody will go with you, we're glad to have you there. If you're an adult and just want to be a part of that, please uh, let me know that you'd like to be some kind of a support staff, and we'll be glad to have you there. And one more thing. On May the 8th, 
We've invited all the area congregations to come here as part of our uh, area-wide youth devotionals. Uh, they've been going on the second Sunday of the month throughout September. will be the culminating event, and we should have you know several other congregations visiting with us. If uh, you want to help provide some snacks or some support there, I'll have a sign-up list as the month turns into April, and uh, we should be invaded by several folks and have a, a special service and probably then some snacks and then another devotional after that. So we've got a lot of things happening for us, a lot of things going on. Hope you'll take advantage of that and uh, to be with us. Um, the week before we go to camp, there's also a camp at Faulkner called Inspire. And uh, if you're a Faulkner fan and would like to spend two whole weeks at, at Faulkner, you can talk to me about the details of Inspire. I'm going to speak at that particular camp for three days and then come back here to get ready for our camp. So if you're interested in any of these events coming up for your teenagers or your young people, please let us know and, and we'll be involved. And having taken care of all of our commercials, let, let's study a little bit. Over the past, I don't know, seven or more years, I've really tried to focus when I talk to young people about attitudes over just actions. What you do as a Christian is very, very important. Uh, the book of Titus will say, people claim to know God, but by their deeds they deny Him. It's very important what Christians do. But lately, I, I've really been dealing with not just attitudes over actions, but attitudes over emotions. Attended a seminar that John Babbler, uh, he's a police chaplain and a fire chaplain out of the Fort Worth area. They're asking the public safety chaplains to expand our duties and instead of just responding to a police business, they want us to respond with the fire and rescue guys too. And they're making a real effort to kind of train us up. They they, they tell us that there's a need there. And uh, so we had some, some training taking place. And, and John came in and was, was talking about when you're dealing with people in crisis, he said, you know, a lot of times we use our emotions as a GPS. We use our emotions as a compass. And he said, really, your emotions aren't, aren't very good directionals. He said, really, your emotions just tell you information, kind of like a, a, a thermometer. And they should tell you something is going on internally, but you should never use your emotions as a direction finder or, or that tell you how to go or how to act. And so attitude over emotion is very, very important. And tonight I'd like to just kind of explore that concept and talk about maybe some prerequisite attitudes for Christianity. Uh, I remember an old rock song, and I'm really not sure which one it is, but at the beginning there's a lot of noise and there's a guitar rift, and I think... Uh, I think it's Eddie Van Halen says, funny, I don't feel tardy. Well, there's an objective there. You, you, it doesn't matter if you feel late or not. If the bell rings, guess what? You're late. Now, last night I was driving in from Augusta, Georgia, and it, it, it didn't feel like 12 o'clock. And I was in one time zone, and all of a sudden I crossed the line, and I was in another time zone. And then by the time I got home, the time moved again. I didn't know what time to feel like it was. I, you know, I felt like I was a time traveler because it was 11, then it was 12, then it was 1, and then it was 3. And wow, what do you have to feel to be a Christian? Well, I'm afraid sometimes we get so wrapped up in our feelings, and we let our feelings control us, that we have difficulties, first of all, in serving God, second of all, in serving others. And third of all, and just being faithful and being active. So just some prerequisite attitudes for Christianity. Normally when I preach, I, I do what you would call expository preaching. You take a, a group of verses that are connected in context, and we explore that context. And from that context, you find facts, concepts, and applications. Well, this is more of a speech than an expository lesson, at least on the surface. Uh, and just basically looking at attitudes for Christianity, Jesus says in Mark chapter 1, verse 17, Come after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Uh, the process that Jesus is describing here is not follow me, and I'll show you what to do. He says, follow me, and I will make you to become 
I'm going to change you into something that you're supposed to be. In the discussion with Nicodemus, Jesus said, in order to be a child of God, you must be born again. That Greek word, anothen, is really interesting. It can be translated anew, it can be again, it can be above. And when we translated that as part of a Greek project when I was in school, that's what I did with the word. You must be born anew again from above. It's a change in your shift. Nicodemus felt like he was righteous with God simply because he was great, 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 great granddaddy was. And that was Abraham. And Jesus said, you've got to change the way you think about some things. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we are being changed, literally a metamorphosis into the image of Christ as we behold him. So what are those changes? What are those attitudinal changes? Attitude number one. We must recognize or realize our condition without God. Sometimes we come to religious activities and we talk about folks who were raised in the church. I've been a Christian all my life. No, you haven't. At some point, the Bible teaches every one of us was a sinner. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23. We come to God not because God needs us but because we need God. There's none righteous, no, not one, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Folks, we are not here because God needs anything from us. We are here because we need something from God. And so many times it's easy for us to become spiritually arrogant. It's easy for us to, to feel like that we're sufficient of ourselves. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15.10, by God's grace, I am what I am. In 2 Corinthians 3, 5, Paul says our sufficiency, our competency, our ability to do or to be comes from God. John 15, 5, Jesus tells his disciples, without me, you can do nothing. And so the first thing is, is, is we've got to realize that we're not self-sufficient on our own. We must realize that we come to God not to offer Him anything, but to ask Him for His blessings and His mercy. And so recognizing what we are without God is, is a prerequisite. Sometimes we feel like that, that our righteousness somehow sets us apart. Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13, Jesus warned the people there. said, you offer me lip service. In vain do they honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Uh, Jesus quotes that in Matthew 15, 8, and 9. And then in Mark chapter 7, Jesus warns that, that you've elevated your own wisdom and your own doctrines and your own philosophy over the teachings of God. It's important to recognize what we are without God because if we don't understand that there's an emptiness in us without God, we won't actually seek God. We'll be seeking the praise of other people. In Matthew chapter 7, when Jesus talks about judging He'll say, judge not that you be not judged, because with the same measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. And then he sets up this scenario. And the scenario that he sets up is not about people who look at something and say, here's a standard of right versus wrong, and, and you're measuring that. That's, that's not what judging is about. You know, the next time you get pulled over for speeding, look at that police officer and say, you're judging me. <laughs> no, there's, there's a numbers on the side of the highway, and if you go faster than those numbers, that's not a judgment call. You're either in or you're out. But in Matthew 7, he says, you, you take a, a, a guy with a plank in his eye, a beam, literally, a board sticking out of his eye, and he walks up to another guy, and he says, you've got a speck of sawdust in your eye. Let me get that out for you. It was this spiritual arrogance where these people were making themselves feel better about who they were not because they were complying with God but because they were comparing themselves with others and judging is not about saying I've got a standard that this is right and that this is wrong but judging is where I take something tiny in your life and magnify it and take something large in my life and minimize it and when our relationships with each other is based on comparing ourselves with each other rather than really understanding or comprehending that we're supposed to be serving God, we get all out of whack. And then all of a sudden what happens is that my attitude is not that I need God. 
My attitude is that, that I'm the standard. My attitude is that I'm superior. And then I come away with this spiritual arrogance. And then I'm hard to fellowship. It's hard for me to get along with you, and it's hard for you to get along with me, because then it's almost like this feeding frenzy. If I can make you look bad, I'm better. And so many times in the churches, we see people that are competing for who's the most righteous, and it sets up a, a, an atmosphere where we're ashamed, to be honest. It sets up an atmosphere, and, and, and by the way, as a counselor, I talk to people who have marital problems. Statistically, People in the church, in our fellowship, who come to marriage counseling have been in trouble for five years before they seek a counselor. And the big thing is they say, I'm ashamed to tell anybody at church. I'm ashamed to talk to the elders. And I'm ashamed to talk to the preacher. Why? Because we're supposed to come to, to church and be perfect. And if we admit that we struggle, if we admit that we have problems, if we admit there's anything going on, then we'll feel like that we're not superior Folks, you've got to understand that when I walk through these doors, it's not because I'm here because I'm something special for God. I walk in those doors because I admit that I'm a sinner and need a Savior. And when we all have that attitude, recognize what I am without God, then it changes why we're here together. One, I think it was Brother Allen at Harding said, you know, the, the object of Christianity is not to, to proclaim ourselves as the chef. I'm a beggar who's found bread, and I'm telling the other beggars where I found it. I didn't cook the bread. I'm a beggar who's found bread and telling the other beggars where to find it. So the first prerequisite attitude for Christianity is recognizing in our lives a fundamental need for God. Recognize what I am without God. Number two, there's a recognition that once I realize what I am without God, I must regret that situation. I hear people say all the time, you know, well, I'm out of shape. And then they laugh and eat a donut. Now, there's nothing wrong with being out of shape. There's nothing wrong with eating donuts, okay? But don't say I'm out of shape and then eat it. Either go, I'm cultivating a certain look. <laughs> you know, Derek Horse, my friend who weighs over 300 pounds and about 6'7", he says, you've got to work a lifetime to get a body like this. And, and he's right. He's been packing it in there for years. And uh, if you need him to hold something down, he's there for it. Now, you're not going to try to run away with anything with Derek, but that, that's the way it is. And sometimes we get into a situation, and our relationship with sin is almost like a flirting relationship. We try to see how close we can get to it and, well, is it exactly wrong? And then really, instead of trying to live morally excellent lives, we have this technicality drawn where if we can just get a little bit close to it. And really, the attitude of Christianity is we must regret our sinful condition. We've got to develop a relationship with sin that says we hate it. Interestingly enough, if, if we don't hate sin... We end up hating God. Because if I become friends with sin, everything you say yes to is something else you say no to. Romans chapter 1, when Paul talks to the people there, he said, because of your relationship with sin, what you ended up doing was you ended up hating God. And that's an acronym that outlines Romans chapter 1. They honored Him not they acknowledged him not, they thanked him not, and they exchanged his image for the image of things that they could see created. And, and really what happened, they did not regret the things that God told them to stay away from, and they ended up hating God. They didn't submit to his will, they didn't follow him, because they didn't regret their sinful condition. And really when I recognize that, that what I'm doing is wrong, it's not where I regret that I got caught it's not that I regret that I'm going to suffer consequences. It's got to be a true thing that I regret that I violated what I'm supposed to be with God. We've been talking about gray areas in our Bible class. We've been studying in 1 Corinthians, and we moved into 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And, of course, in the Corinthian church, you had some people from a Jewish background. You had the people from the Corinthian background. You had folks who were slaves and folks who were free. And the Jews wouldn't eat certain meats, and then some people who'd come out of idolatry wouldn't eat the meat in, in the uh, sold in the meat markets, and 
one of the things that we discussed that would be a problem if we were trying to worship with people from a Jewish background is they, they wouldn't eat bacon. Brady White says that's a deal breaker. <laughs> you got you got to have bacon. In the Old Testament, when God said these foods are unclean, it wasn't that those people looked at bacon and barbecue and ribs and went, man, I wish we could have some of that. When the Jews said it was unclean, it was detestable. It was nasty. They, it, it wasn't, oh, this looks good. I wish God, hey, man, I can't believe you eat that stuff. That's awful. That's sickening. That's disgusting. I've, I've got a, a friend who's an Orthodox Jew. He has a little pond. He lets us come over there and fish sometimes. Lets the, the, he's the tactical medic with SWAT. He lets the guys bring their little kids over there. And one of the guys asked him the other day, he said, you got any catfish in your pond? And he stepped back. He said, no, I don't have catfish in my pond. Well, they're unclean animals. For a Jew to be able to eat anything from the water, it has to have fins and scales. And, and it wasn't just like, no, I prefer to have largemouth bass in my pond. It was, no, I don't want those things in my pond. They're against what I believe is right. And I'm afraid our relationship with sin is, is more like our hypothetical relationship with bacon. Man, I wish I could have some of that. It's too bad I can't. And we've got to look at sin from the standpoint that God says, everything I've ever asked you not to do is bad for you. And if you do it, if you touch it, if you taste it, it's bad. I'm technically not supposed to have sugar. It doesn't always work as a motivation for me. Uh, I've been hypoglycemic slightly since I was like in the ninth grade. They moved my lunch period from 11 to 11.30. And in that period from 11 to 11.30, I'd get dizzy and pass out in class. It was a great couple of months, you know, figuring out what was going on with me. And so for a long, long time, I sort of had to be careful with not just what I eat, but when I ate it and, and how I did it. And when we first got married, Jackie became the, I'm going to be in charge of Lonnie's health Nazi. And uh, in a loving sort of way, because, you know, you're, I was 21 years old, and we are preaching at this little church in Salem, Arkansas, and every time you went to visit somebody, well, preacher, have some pie. You know, no, I'm not, but since you made it, you know, and so I was killing myself. You know, I was just never able to regulate, and so I told Jackie, I said, you got to help me. And Jackie got good at it. We'd go somewhere, and they'd say, would you like some pie? And she'd say, he can't have any. I'll take a piece. And we go somewhere, well, I made a cake. He's not allowed to have that. I'll take some. And, we, and, and Jackie got real good at telling folks I couldn't have sugar. And we ended up at my grandmother's house for Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner. And I'm at my grandmother's house, and I drank a big glass of milk, and I got up and went into the kitchen. They're all in there. It's been months since I've had sugar. And I opened the refrigerator door, and there in my grandmother's refrigerator were those little white powdered donuts. And they were saying, eat me. It's okay. She's not in here. So I grabbed a handful of those little fellas, and I poured me a glass of milk. And just as I was about to take a bite of one, I heard somebody get up, and I thought it was the sugar Nazi. So I ate one real fast, kind of like eating an aspirin. And then it settled back down. I said, well, I'll enjoy this next one. And when I turned it around, the entire southern hemisphere of that little donut was covered in green mold. I don't know how long my grandmother had those donuts, but all of a sudden I was penitent from eating those donuts. <laughs> the donut that was already in there took a chicken leg and slammed it into the ring ropes and then jumped off the top. All I was like, oh, but I wasn't sorry that I'd eaten the sugar. I was sorry that I'd gotten caught. I was sorry that I was going to suffer the consequences. When we look at sin, it's not, oh, I'm not supposed to have it, but if nobody's looking, it'll be okay. We've got to look at sin and say, these are the things that God detests. And if I involve myself in them, and really it's, if I don't control my sugar, sugar is poison to me. Now I can get by with a little bit of it. I can eat it with protein. I can eat it after a workout. But if I just ate it all the time, and, and in truth, I really have to view it as poison. Because at some point it will kill me if I let it get out of control. And so how much poison will you eat? When we start looking at sin and say this is spiritual poison, that God didn't say, hey, it looks good, it tastes good, it 
and you just shouldn't have it because I don't want you to have it. We have to look at it and say, God says to stay away from it because He knows spiritually it will kill us. God told Eve, everything in this garden you can have except one tree. And when you eat it, you'll die. It was beautiful to look at. It was desirous to eat and become like God. But she didn't regret her relationship with that fruit. In fact, what was she doing in the center of the garden staring at the fruit tree? If she had never been near it, she'd have never been tempted. And a prerequisite attitude for Christianity is that I've got to look at the things that God says are sinful, and I must regret them, and I must repent from the fact that I've been involved with those things. Godly sorrow works repentance that leads to salvation that is not to be regretted. And once my attitude is that I recognize what I am without God, that I regret my sinful condition, that I no longer want to be in a place where I'm living counter to God, and I must repent of that and change, once I get those things out of my life, the next attitude is I've got to be obsessed with filling my life up with God. I don't know what your hobby is, but hobbies can be consuming. Um, the guys who play golf, they tell me that it, it just overtakes you because you can have a great game one day and then one day just be miserable. But that one time, if you ever hit that 250-yard drive, you've you got to try the rest of your life to hit another one of those. I do that with deer hunting. You're sitting there in those woods and that buck walks out or you want to see another one just like it next year. I know guys who sit around in front of their Xboxes and defend the world from aliens over and over and, and over again. Uh, my desk, well, my, my table outside my lobby, covered with climbing magazines. When Troy and I were going to go out west and climb, you know, all I could do with my spare time was look up these routes over there near El Capitan. And we became consumed with what it was we were going to do in the fall last year. Are we consumed with what it is that God wants us to do and be? Or is God an afterthought in our lives? When we get up in the morning, is it what am I going to do for me today or is it how am I going to serve God today? Submissiveness to God basically means that, that we give everything we have to God. In Luke chapter 5, the disciples have stayed up all night. They're fishing you don't spend all night doing things that aren't important to you. Now, they're not necessarily really important, but you don't spend all night doing things that aren't important to you. And on this particular occasion, through a miracle of Jesus, these guys have a miraculous catch of fish. They bring them to the shore. And, and, and since this is a miracle, I believe that if what was going on the market was a, an 18-inch long, two-pound red snapper, that's what that net was full of. These guys have made their fortune. They've got a net full of miraculous fish that is so huge that, that they can't even bring it in. And Luke chapter 5 verse 11 says, They forsook all and followed Him. They walked away from their dreams, from their goals, from their agenda, and they followed Jesus. And folks, until we're willing to after realizing what we are without God, regretting and repenting, turn our lives over and become obsessed with following Him. There's one of those old, old, old preacher stories where you got the farm animals talking about, you know, doing something nice for the farmer. And uh, chickens suggest, well, let's feed the farmer breakfast. And the pig says to the chicken, for you, that's involvement. For me, that's commitment. And I guess that's what we're talking about is commitment, being submissive to God and saying, I'm willing to turn over everything I have. We, I've left everything to follow you. Paul says in Philippians, everything I thought was important, all my pedigree in Judaism, all the things that I would have boasted about, I've counted those things as rubbish in order to follow God. I heard a story a long time ago, and I don't know if it's true or not. But the story's about a little family. They were driving somewhere, and they were in a car accident. And the, the mom was pretty severely hurt. And so they'd got to 
do some work on her and they need to blood type and they need to, to have some blood given. And the only person matching hers is their, their little girl. And so the doctors and nurses come out and they say, we need to take some of your, your blood and give it to your mom. And the little girl says, okay. And so they, you know, hook her up to the machine and start the things working. And they notice just after a little bit that she's just crying. And the nurse looks at the little girl and says, what is it, sweetheart? And she says, how long will it be? And the nurse says, what do you mean, how long will it be? She says, well, how long will it be till I die? You're, you're taking my blood. I said, we're not taking it all, sweetie, just some. And this little girl in her innocence said, I'll give everything I have to my mom. I'll give it all so she can live. Is your relationship with God that? How long will it be till I die? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. See, if, if you go out to my truck and you open my toolbox and you pull out golf clubs, everybody understands we're going golfing. If you go out to my truck and you open my toolbox and you get out my bow or my rifle, everybody knows we're going to hunt or shoot. If you go out to my truck and you open the toolbox and you get my ropes out, we're going climbing. You go out to my truck and you open my toolbox and you get a cross. What are we going to do? We're going to go to church? We're going to follow Jesus? No. See, when you see a cross... Somebody's going to die. And until we understand that following God requires the attitude that I will give Him my all and that I'm willing to die for Him, we don't understand submissiveness like we should. The next attitude that's prerequisite to Christianity is that I must be willing to love my neighbor actively and it's interesting the relationship between people and God in fact every time Jesus is asked to sum it up what's the greatest command Jesus talks about relationship with God and relationship with people in fact when Jesus was asked to give the greatest command in Mark chapter 12 verse 28 through 31 he says this is the greatest command love the Lord your God with all your heart soul strength and mind and the second is likened to it love your neighbor as yourself now Jesus is not showing off when they ask him he's, he's not proving how good he is at Bible Bowl he says the two concepts are interwoven that if you understand what the command if you understand the law itself that everything that God was about is, is, first of all, the attitude toward Him and then the attitude toward others. And you can't have the proper attitude toward God and not have the proper attitude toward people. In fact, in 1 John 4, 19 through 21, Jesus says, If you say you love God, but you turn around and hate your brother, you are a liar and there is no truth in you. The prerequisite for Christianity says that you can't come here and sing praises to God and hold grudges against the people you're singing with. You can't sing praises to God and have unfinished business with the people you're supposed to be in the family with. You can't come in here and say, oh, I love God, but you know, I'm mad at what they did 15 years ago. John said through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that if you can't get over that, you might as well not say you love God because you're lying when you do. And those are not my words, those are the words of Scripture. And the prerequisite attitude for Christianity is that Christians learn to get along with each other. And we let past things be in the past. And we let them go. And we turn them over to God. 1 John 3.16, this is love. 
that Christ laid down his life for us and we laid down our lives for others. Isn't that interesting? See, if I were going to anticipate how to finish that verse, Jesus laid down his life for us and we should lay down our life for him. That's said in 2 Corinthians 5. But when John talks about it, John said, since Jesus laid down his life for you, you got to be willing to lay down your life for other people. And that requires an active love. That's not just waiting on how you treat me to determine how I treat you. But it's proactive. It's not predetermined by what I think about you. It says that Jesus died for you, you die for others. In fact, 1 John 3, 19 through 18 says, If you have this world's goods and you can't share them with your brother, the love of God does not abide in you. Prerequisite for Christianity is we must love our neighbors actively. Number six, after understanding that we've got to love each other, love will produce purity. Young people, your boyfriend or your girlfriend, if they love you, are trying to help you be pure. And if they're not trying to help you be pure, they don't love you. Romans chapter 13 says that, that love will not sin with you and love won't sin against you. And so when somebody says, I love you, they don't lead you into sin. Th that love should produce some type of purity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 through 8 talks about what love is. And every time we read that section that's descriptive of love, it talks about a selflessness that puts the needs of other people above our rights. Love is not rude, it's not selfish, it's not self seeking. Romans 13 says, Owe no man anything but to love. And really what that means is that the only debt that outstands between us is love, and that love produces purity. And I'm afraid sometimes we only love people that we think can do things for us. I'm afraid we only love people that we think can help us out. I'm afraid sometimes we recruit people to the church because we think that the church needs them rather than them needing the church. And then number seven, love simply just seeks for peace. If I love you, I'm going to try to get along with you no matter what. L love another person means I want to make this work. Recognizing that some of the things that happen in the human condition are at best temporary. And love that seeks peace basically is the idea, the actual concept of being a peacemaker. Abraham and Lot have flocks and herds that are huge. I like the way Tim puts it, Abraham was a powerful sheik in the Middle East. And then we're uncomfortable with Abraham being a sheik, but that's what he was. And he had massive amounts of wealth. And he and Lot are living in close proximity to each other. And Lot's herdsmen and Abraham's herdsmen are, are, are fighting over the grazing. And Abraham tells Lot, you, you decide what you need to make this work. You tell me where you want your flocks to be and we'll go somewhere else. And if you choose here, I'll go there. And if you go there, I'll go here. And what we don't seem to understand about Abraham is not only was Abraham rich, but Abraham was powerful. Three chapters before that, Chedorlaomer and the kings of the east capture Lot. And Abraham with 300 plus men born and trained in his own household, private army, will go out and rescue Lot. Hey folks, Madison County Sheriff's Department sent their original SWAT team for a, 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 a several weeks seminar to Blackwater. You know what it takes to be trained to be a shooter by a bunch of mercenaries? It's a lot of money. Triple Canopy is a consulting firm that does some of that stuff. They have a 17-day job interview. And they provide the weapons and the materials to see what kind of a shooter you are, all kind of scenarios. And they're training people one at a time. Abraham had a 300-plus member army that was privately trained in his household. What that basically boils down to is if Lot's grazing right there and Abraham wants to graze there, <laughs> Abraham will graze there. Because he's got the muscle to do it. 
This is not that Abraham let Lot graze there because Abraham was, was weak or intimidated. Abraham let Lot graze there because Abraham wanted to get along with Lot. Because all Abraham had to say was, you know what, we're going to take this as our grazing. And those 300 armed men would make sure it happened. But instead of using his muscle, instead of using his might, instead of using his power, Abraham simply said, I'll do what it takes to make this situation work. And, and he let Lot have it. Love is active. Love is pure. And love tries to produce peace. And then the last one, when all else fails, love doesn't. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, that's how we get to the end of the discussion with love. Love never fails. I think probably the word that would best describe that attitude is we have an attitude of patience. We have an attitude of endurance that no matter what you do, I've got to decide to do what's right as long as it takes. In fact, Joe Beam and, and I guess theologically Joe and I are on the same page all the time, but in relationship counseling, he runs a program called Relationship 911 talks about people getting along and, and, and his theory is you do what it takes to make it work as long as it takes to make it work and the attitude is if this thing falls apart it'll be because you made it not because of me and I'll make any change I'll make any concession I'll do what it takes to make our relationship work the biblical concept for that is long suffering the biblical concept for that is endurance we use the word patience, and, but really when we use patience, I'm afraid it makes us click on, onto a filter where we think of in different terms. The, the real word for patience in the Greek is the ability to endure pain. And our relationships with each other is really not predicated on your ability to do what's right. It's on my ability to deal with it when you don't. That a good relationship with the church and a good relationship with the church's people is not expecting the church's people to do right all the time but my ability to deal with it when you don't. My relationship with Jackie is not based on my ability to be a perfect husband, ask her mother. <laughs> my relationship with Jackie is based on her ability to deal with me when I'm not. And without saying anything bad about my wife, it's not about her ability to be a perfect wife. It's my ability to deal with it when she's not. And she's got an attitude that says, when we got married, we'll stay married. There's not a, a, a get-out clause. And no matter what he does, no matter what he says, no matter how irritating he is, I'll deal with it. That's how you make relationships work. Attitudes that are prerequisite for Christianity. There, there's a poem that kind of sums up these attitudes you may recognize it. God blesses people who depend only on Him. They belong to the kingdom of heaven. God blesses people who grieve. They will find comfort. God blesses people who are humble. The earth will belong to them. God blesses those people who want to obey Him more than they want to eat or drink. They will be given what they want. God blesses those people who are merciful. They'll be treated with mercy. God blesses those people whose hearts are pure. They will see Him. God blesses those people who make peace. They'll be called His children. God blesses those people who are treated badly for doing right. They belong to the kingdom of heaven. Folks, you recognize that poem is a, a modern speech paraphrase of the Beatitudes. See, the attitudes that are prerequisite for Christianity come directly from Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Recognize what I am without God. Blessed are those who mourn. Regret what I am without God. Blessed are the meek. Be willing to change from my will to God's will. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. I want to be obsessed with trying to be submissive and fulfill what God wants me to do. Blessed are the merciful, love actively. Blessed are the pure in heart, love will produce purity. 
Blessed are the peacemakers, love will produce peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, love will produce endurance. Folks, when Jesus began to talk about the ideal relationship with people in God, he said the prerequisite attitudes are those right there from Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And if we want to produce a relationship with each other and a relationship with God, those will be our attitudes. And if those are not our attitudes, we can't have a relationship with each other. And if we don't have a relationship with each other, we might as well go home because we don't have a relationship with God. One of two things needs to be repaired tonight, our relationship with God or our relationship with each other. Some of that can be done publicly, some of that can be done privately, whatever the case. If you need to repair a relationship, do that tonight while we stand, while we sing. Jesus come into your heart. If you desire a new life to begin, let Jesus come into your heart. Just now your doubt is give away. Just now reject him no more. Just now open the come into your heart if just for purity now that you sigh let Jesus come into your heart fountains for cleansing are flowing nearby let Jesus come into your heart just now your doubtings give away. Just now reject him no more. Just now throw open the door. Let Jesus come into your heart. If you would join the glad songs of the blessed, let Jesus come into your heart. If you would enter the mansions of rest, let Jesus come into your heart. Just now your doubtings give away. Just now reject him no more. Just now throw open the door. Let Jesus come into your heart. Thank you, Lonnie. Our closing song tonight will be 435, 435. We have the Lord's Supper prepared this evening. If you'd like to partake of it, you'll make your way now to the foyer. You'll be shown where you can be served. We'll have our prayer at the um, first and second stanzas of this song we'll sing. Let me mention this to you. Um, we're financially supporting, to some degree, uh, a television program you may see on some regular basis or every now and then. It's on Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, so you can kind of view it You know, while you're getting ready to come to worship uh, on that uh, My Whammy, you know, a station you get on whatever hookup you have for TV, but uh, it's at 8 o'clock. James Watkins is usually on there, but sometimes there's other gospel preachers, so we have a little little hand in that now, uh, financially supporting it to some degree, so I want you to be aware of that as well as uh, let you know you could look at that and maybe gain some uh, devotional material if you record it, you know, and go back and view it when you want to, or either uh, see it at that time it's on eight o'clock on sunday mornings sing the first and uh, second stanza please <clears throat> more love to thee O christ more love to thee hear <laughs> thou the prayer i may Cry 
praise to thee, more love to thee, more love to thee. Once earthly joy I craved, so peace and rest. Now the Lord I seek, give what is best. This, oh, my prayer shall be more love, oh, Christ, to thee, more love to Shall we pray? Our loving and great Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the privilege of being called your family. You could have chosen to call us great many things. We, you could have called us strangers. For We make ourselves strangers every time we wander from you. We pray that you give us a penitent heart and lead us back to you every time that we stray. You, you could have just called us your creations and even with the great and marvelous work that we see around us and the com complexity that makes us who we are, it, it would have been a great testimony of how powerful you are. You call, could have called us just servants, for we come to you as just servants. And pray that you help us to uh, be good and profitable servants in every undertaking we take for your kingdom but you chose to give us the opportunity to be your children and it's such a great price that thank you to just doesn't seem to be enough words we thank you for that that sacrifice your son made for us we pray that we as we go forth in this week that we show the greatness of being your your children in our words and in our deeds, and that we can bring others back to be with you. In Christ's name we pray, amen.